Hi everybody, I'm Razvi. Welcome to Poon 101 series, where we are solving the binary exploitation room on TryHackMe. In this video, we will solve the very first challenge called Poon 101. Before beginning, let me reset my progress for this room. And without further ado, let's get down to business. As you can see, this very first challenge, this first binary, provides us only with the binary itself, just like every single challenge in this room. And I've already downloaded it. In this video series, since I solved the binaries beforehand, I will go straight to the point. I don't want to waste time using uh, tools that are probably giving us useless or worthless information. Now, on the other hand, if I were on a real time constraint event like a CTF, like one of those CTFs you can find every single weekend on CTF time, I would be, of course, considering different tools like strings or Rabin2 to gain more information about the binary itself and what it might be doing. However, in this case, let us give it execution permissions and see what it does. Okay, let us run it. Hello, I'm going shopping. My mom told me to buy some ingredients, um, but I have low memory capacity, so I forgot most of them. Anyway, she is preparing biryani for lunch. Can you help me to buy those items? Type the required ingredients to make biryani. Nah, bra, you lied me. She did tomato rice instead of biryani. As we can see, it asks for input and then prints some uh, irrelevant information. Now, before disassembling the binary, let us check out what file it is. We can see it's a 64-bit executable, which determines the length of the registers and the wording, the addressing of the CPU, so we know addresses and registers are 8 bytes long. It is dynamically linked and it isn't stripped. Now, let us check what protections this binary has been compiled with. I will be creating our exploit right now and Using comments, since this is a Python file, I will paste the protection so we can better read them. We can see it has full relocation read only, which we will talk about in future videos. There are no canaries. The NX bit is enabled, that means that we cannot execute code from the stack or heap segment. Pi is enabled, that means it is a position independent executable or position independent code and basically nothing else. For disassembling and debugging throughout all these videos, I will be using mainly Cutter and Radar 2. You can use, of course, whatever debugger, disassembler, decompiler, whatever you like. So I will use now Cutter to open this file and see its assembly code, so we better understand what is happening. Okay, using Cutter, we can see the functions this binary has. We are interested, of course, in the main function because that's where our program starts, at least for us as user or attacker in this case. And we can check uh, the segments and sections of the binary. We can check their permissions in case there is some writable and executable segment that we can abuse, which is not the case. So let us take a look at the code itself. I will make this a bit bigger. Okay, we can see right from the beginning it calls setup which is a function that performs several settings for the program itself we don't really care about it it then calls banner which is a function that prints to the standard output some string and then it performs also uh, several calls to puts with the strings hello i am going to go shopping type the required ingredients and then it calls gets which is a very dangerous function because it performs no bound checking on the user input. That is, we can write whatever and how much data we want. It won't stop reading data until we, of course, insert some special character that prevents gets from reading any longer. We can see that the first parameter of gets, which is the RDI register, is actually the address of the S variable which is RBP minus 40 in hexadecimal. This is very important because from this address, gets starts writing into memory our input. That means that using gets, we can write 40 in hexadecimal bytes and reach RBP. We write eight more and we reach the saved return address of main. Let's see what else is happening here. We can see it then performs a compare a comparison. It checks if this variable right here, RBP minus four, 
is equal to 539 in hexadecimal. In fact, it checks if it isn't equal. As you can see, this conditional jump right here means jump if not equal. If it isn't equal, it then follows the true branch right here. And we can see it calls system with the bin sh string as the parameter, as the command to execute. Basically, if we manage to reach the true branch of this conditional jump, that is this variable to be different from this value right here, we will get a shell. Now, what is this variable for h? As you can see, at the very beginning of the main, the value 539 in hexadecimal is being stored into it. By the way, this variable has been declared as an unsigned 64-bit long integer. At least that's what Carter detects. Which basically means that 8 bytes of memory have been allocated to store this variable, to store its value. Which in turn doesn't necessarily imply that all of them will be used to store the actual variable, as we will later see. That's my interpretation of the code. You can, of course, use the decompiler that comes with Cutter by default, which is also the same decompiler that Ghidra uses. Or if you are using IDA, for example, you can use their uh, decompiler, which is called pseudocode in the context of IDA instead of decompiler. Now, one small but important detail right here is that even though our variable is declared as a 64 bits integer, we can see that at the time of reading its value and compare it to this literal right here, sorry, it is being interpreted as a 32 bits integer. We can detect this very same behavior inspecting the assembly code by looking at this compare instruction right here. As you can see, even though it's accessing, it's reading the content of this address, which is rbp-4, it is reading it as a double word, that is 4 bytes. It happens the same with this move instruction, when it's assigning its initial value, that we will have to overwrite, of course. Now remember that in computers we have several data representations, like the nibble, which is half a byte, 4 bits, we have a byte, we have a word, which are two bytes, 16 bits, and then we have double and quad words, which are 32 bits and 64 respectively. That is four bytes and eight bytes. Now, how can we abuse this binary? How can we get to change to overwrite the contents of this variable? Since we know that get function allows us to write as much data as we want, we have just to consider where are we writing from? In this case, it is rbp-40. Let us draw this since it will help us understand what is actually happening here. Let's say this is our stack. And as you may already know, stack grows from higher addresses towards lower ones. And I like to draw it like this. Let's imagine for a moment that, for example, the rbp, our base pointer, lives right here. And we know that at rbp-4 lives the variable we want to overwrite. That is somewhere around here. As you can see, I'm drawing just half a memory cell, a memory position addressing, because remember, we are on a 64-bit architecture. This binary has been compiled for 64 bits. And in order for us to consume the memory cell, we have to reference rbp-8. But in this case, we are referencing rbp-4. Now we have to draw where get starts writing our data from, and that is rbp-40. Let's say, for example, that rbp-40 happens to be right here. Remember that writing into memory happens in the exact opposite direction as the stack grows. That is, writing into memory happens from lower towards higher addresses. That is, when it comes to writing when get starts saving our input into the stack, it will start writing right here. Let's say this is address 0, this is 1, 2, 3, and suppose we have 8 bytes right here. It will write our first byte in the 0th address, the next one in the first address, in the second one, in the third, and so forth. Then it will skip to this memory cell and repeat the process. 
that is gets will keep writing into memory until we reach whatever we want because remember that gets doesn't perform any kind of checking on the length of our input so we will have to write to overwrite all these memory cells until we reach our var right here which is writing these four bytes i will draw them in red writing these four bytes right here and since this variable is four bytes long it is enough for us to overwrite its first byte right here in order for it to change its value in other words how long must our input be how many bytes do we have to provide gets well we have to provide it the difference from rbp minus 40 to rbp minus 4 plus 1 which is basically the same as overwriting all these memory addresses right here plus 1 which is this one right here and this way we manage to overwrite the variable now let us transform this theory into an actual exploit I will be using Poon tools for all these videos and I am leaving in the description of this video the link to their official documentation which you can check out I really recommend you learning Poon tools if you are uh, interested in binary exploitation and reverse engineering so we can do it like this we first import our library and then we declare our binary what binary we want to work with as you can see i am also setting the context that binary environment variable which is inherited from poon library and this will define some options regarding the process that i am about to launch by the way let me specify it like this relative to our current location now we have to define the payload we want it to provide we can provide a character as input and how many a's do we want well as we've just seen we need sorry 40 in hexadecimal minus 4 in hexadecimal which is also the same as 4 in decimal plus 1 let me define the process i am about to launch its output even though i can basically skip it then i will send my payload and finally i want an interactive session so i can make use of the shell that this will spawn and now let us execute and see if it actually works i will launch it with python 3 exploit let us see if it works i have some typo right here my code is incorrect because i must use another pair of parentheses since it is interpreting this plus sign right here as a concatenation operation and i want it to actually add values not concatenate strings and that's basically what it's saying it can't concatenate integer to bytes i want it to sum the values now let us execute thanks here's a small gift for you and as you can see i already got my shell now let us execute it on the remote side on the victim machine the remote machine is already deployed i have the ip address right here i already connected to try hackmis vpn and now i have to change my script my exploit because i don't want to execute the local process i want to execute or rather to connect to a remote process running somewhere like this ip and port 9001 yes that's correct and now let us test our exploit once again and as you can see we have a shell on the remote machine we can now read our flag and check if it is correct which it is and that was the very first binary of the poon 101 series where we exploited a vulnerable call to the get function and overflow the buffer in order to overwrite the value of a variable stored in the stack if you have any doubts or suggestions or if there's something you want to say leave a comment below I hope you liked the video and found it useful. See you in the next one. Until then, GG.